towards the uh, end of his life, he, he wrote the notes for his own, so from his, some of his own paintings. His notes, he wrote, wrote a great, uh, a great painting called The Vision of Judgment. And um, somebody wanted an explanatory note, and he said, uh, what it will be exclaimed when the sun rises. A man will say to you, do you not see a round disk of fire somewhat the size of a guinea? You must reply, no, no, no. I see the innumerable hosts of heaven crying, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now, he's not saying that we don't have the experience ocularly of a round disk of fire somewhat the size of a guinea. But he says if that's what we're, all we're seeing, then we're not seeing right. In fact, his view of what vision is, and particularly his understanding of the relationship between what we think of as the outer, supposedly dead, quote-unquote, objective material world out there, the stuff we do our science on in way and measure, and the inward, supposedly separate, private little soul that you know, is somehow accidentally here and is this little thing in our head that somehow floats in the holes of our values, yeah? He rejected that entire view. I mean, absolutely and completely. And so completely that he never seems to have actually had it, you know, in spite of the fact he brought into a world of thought and felt like that. His view was that children, children don't think like that at all. Children have has to be dumped, drummed into children to stop thinking in another way and they have to be taught to think that the world is dead and meaningless and that they can do stuff to it, you know. Um, and he seems to have never lost that, that, that childlike vision. But he did reflect on it philosophically, and I'd like, uh, just while we're thinking about, about vision, um, to just look at something I've put right at the beginning of the, the extract I've given you. Um, this is an extract from a very strange book, often quoted, I think often misquoted, um, called The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And um, it has problems of heaven and problems of hell, and it has it's called a memorable fancy. It's got all kinds of, it's a very strange word. Um, there are some plates from it uh, here on one of these sheets. Um, yeah, there. But uh, it starts with some kind of principles. And I just want to give you three, which seems to me, this is quite an early work of plates, to kind of animate. And in fact, you kind of bear them in mind for everything else we say. And then, um, as they would have said in the 60s, they're pretty mind blowing. First comes principle number one it's a total challenge to dualism, to a dualistic way of thinking of body, soul, matter, spirit, subject, or that whole way which since day can't we split the world up. Um, which is a really comparatively recent development. It's not the mythological way of thinking that most human beings have had for most of the time. This is what he says. Man has no body distinct from his soul. For that called body is a portion of soul discerned by the five senses, the chief inlet of soul in this age. Now just think about that for a minute. Blake is saying that the five senses, which are your only way of getting hold of what, you know, is supposed to be out there. So this is your sight and your sense and your touch and your smell. He isn't saying that those are inlets of physical stuff that you can then do something spiritual with if you feel like it on the inside. He says the five senses are the inlet of soul. So he's actually saying everything out there that you see is soul. The sun and moon and the stars and the green growing things, and other people's bodies and your own body and all those things that you perceive with their, your senses are spiritual. They are spiritual. And um, you mustn't confine consciousness and awareness and value and beauty and life and all of those things that you think are islanded privately in human subjectivity. He says they're all, actually, all the time, all the way out there. Surrounding you. And what you get when you look at the world is, yes, yes, you see physical things and you construct them in a certain way, and that's great. But what you're seeing is soul. It's a pretty short thing to say. And soul is clearly therefore so, so there's nobody distinct from soul. soul. Then he goes, energy is the, uh, 
is the only life and is from the body and reason now it's talking, is the bound or outward circumference of energy. Isn't that extraordinary? I mean, like, we know, it's all talking about we don't get all of Blake. <laughs> I'm not sure any of us really get this. Uh, what does it mean to say that reason is the um, bound or outward circumference of energy? Obviously, reason is very much about drawing boundaries and lines. Um, I might say something from one of Blake's letters that might help you to understand this phrase, reason is the bound or outwards. Blake wrote a great deal um, about what he called the bounding line. He was trained rigorously, he had a seven-year apprenticeship as an engraver on copper, okay? So, you don't want to make mistakes with that, you know? Copper is not a medium um, in which you do lots of little fine shading and grading and little stipples and dips, you know, you, if you draw a line, you want it to be the, the line you mean. And Blake loved outlines. He thought making outlines was really important. I mean, you, know, you can see that from his art. Um, and he used the word bounding, which is a very interesting word. I remember um, when I was a student in the late 70s hearing, Chris, uh, hearing Jeffrey Hill lecturing on Blake uh, in this university, uh, giving a great lecture on the bounding line. And he pointed out a really simple thing that, that Blake's use of the word bounding, the word bounding, is, is a gloriously um, paradoxical word. Right? On the one hand, bounding is about binding, it's about bounding something in, bounding and boundaries. But on the other hand, we use the word bounding to describe energetic movement, bounding along. We talk about, you know, a grace abounding, uh, abundance. There's, there's a kind of sense in which, paradoxically, that which limits is also that which keeps force and fierceness and energy. Does that make sense? That, um, so the bounding, the bounding, if you think about, about reason as a circumference, so you say, reason draws some lines, okay? And they may be good lines for reason to draw, but what reason is doing is concentrating in energy, which is more than reason. And later on in his work, he comes to think about what that energy might be in terms of imagination and in terms of God's life within us, okay? So it's not that he has no place for reason. But to call reason a circumference is uh, a very different thing um, from, from thinking of reason as, as uh, in the way that it was thought of in, 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 in Blake's own time. Energy is eternal delight is the third thing. So, um, that's just a little, we're getting ahead of ourselves here, that's a, just a little bit of uh, his sense of um, vision. The five senses are the inlet of soul. Reason is a circumference. Now, um, one thing that all the books say, and they always say it in the same way about Blake, and it, it's always books about Blake are inevitably written by, by academics who have had a, the benefit of a good school and a good university education. And have therefore been schooled. They're often been to Oxford or Cambridge, and they've all they've been schooled in a particular way. And of course, one of the things that they discover as they start writing their lives of Blake is that Blake never went to university, and in fact, never went to school. Uh, and yes, you know, he is obviously a total genius, and um, and uh, he's very, very widely read. And uh, so. Uh, they have a word, which is always the same word that's used by academics writing about brilliant non-academics. And the word is, they say, Blake was an autodidact. <laughs> what they mean is he's self-taught. Uh, which is an astonishing thing. But isn't it interesting that when academics want to say that somebody is self-taught, they have to say it in Greek. <laughs> autodidact, that's what self-taught is in Greek. And why do they do that? It's almost as though they still wanted to keep the barrier. They still wanted to do a kind of us and them thing. Do you know he's an autodidact? Extraordinary how he managed it. Yeah. Um, now, the fact that Blake was an autodidact is really important. Um, obviously, it shows you know courage and energy and determination. There are two sides to that. One side, there are lots of great writers who've been, who've been self-taught to be autodidacts, and um, sometimes it means that they the, 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 the brilliant side of it is it means they're completely free and original thinkers. They haven't been told, they haven't had it drummed into them by any of the six four methods what it is they're supposed to say, or what it is that they're supposed to think, or which two writers go together and which two writers don't go together, or what suits that period and what doesn't suit that period. So they haven't had their options limited by people.
people who want them to pass exams. And that sometimes means that they have a brilliant new approach, they have great ideas. On the other hand, they haven't been taught um, you know, simple arts of summary, the way of cogently putting things, you know, absolute clarity so that the poor marker of your essay on the 65th essay and the seventh cup of coffee will still get it. So, and autodidacts generally tend to be completely in love with language because language is deliriously lovable. And um, they use lots of long words and strange string long sentences together. You know, the, the style of writing also can actually sometimes be seen to a person who's had a university that kind of unnecessarily obscure. Um, but actually, that, that floridness and wordiness is sometimes not obscurity, it's, like it's a kind of act of love, really. Um, it's people wanting to draw these things. So there are, there are some difficult sides of reading books by people who, who haven't, as it were, had that official schooling in the world of books. But there are brilliant compensations, and the most brilliant of all is that they can come to a set of notions that we've taken for granted and just completely open them up because they've not been told to take them for granted. But in the case of Blake, it's not simply that, quote unquote, he didn't have the opportunity to go to university. It's much more serious than that. It's that by the time he had worked out from his own perspective what was being taught in the university and how and why it was being taught, he not only was glad that he didn't go, but he launched a huge attack on the whole education system, which is not what autodidacts are supposed to do. You know, from the point of the people, in view of the people inside the education system, they ought to be jolly glad that we recognise that they're really quite good, despite having gone to the same, not gone to our school. Uh, but I'd like just briefly, if we if we turn over from the handout to you, just to you. Um, uh, now, how, oh, how have I put it here? Oh, perhaps I haven't given it to you. I was going to give you a wonderful passage in which he, uh, we'll have a look at that juice, in which he says, I turn my eyes to the, the universities of Europe. And um, it's, uh, it's a pretty uh, excoriating um, and terrible uh, condemnation. We'll, we'll, we'll save that for when we talk about uh, Blake as prophet, see what he actually has to say about it is that. Saying, 
Joseph Arimathea among the hills of Albion, using this old quasi-mythical word, word for the British Isles. Albion became hugely important as a word for him as he, as he developed. And of course, we all know the bit of Blake that everybody knows, um, which we sing as Jerusalem, but it's actually from a poem called Milton. And it's not in the poem Jerusalem. He asks that question openly. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy land of God on England's pleasant pastures green? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our tardy hills? And that image of Christ as a child radiant in the midst of the hills of the place where he felt Albion was destroying itself. He felt he, he, he wrote in the end a great allegorical poem, also called Jerusalem, a long poem which we'll look at in the, the final session, in which Albion, representing all of us, humanity, but humanity particularly, even there, who has turned aside from the divine child into what he calls in that poem the wastes of the moral law. To, into a kind of judgmental, hypocritical, divisive, oppressive, false religion in which children and women in particular are crushed. And Blake's very sensitive to what was going on in the machinery of religion and state. And in his poem, Albion, the Somnified, finally comes back to Christ and says to him, O oh, divine imagination, O oh, human body, whom I have crucified.
speaks a lot about emanations and shadows in a language that massively anticipates the writings of Carl Jung. And Jung, of course, is very interested in it. But he thought a lot of what we think of ourselves as ourselves is actually a projection or a shadow of ourselves. And we spend a lot of time serving our shadows and emanations rather than centering on who we really are in the divine love. Um, that makes sense. So I see the fourfold man, the humanity in deadly sleep, the fallen emanation, the spectre in its cruel shadow. I see the past, present, and future existing all at once. That's the kind of thing Blake says all the time, which is where it makes it very difficult to sort of put Blake in his social context, if you take that seriously. Before me, uh, um, all at once before me, O divine spirit, sustain me on thy wings, that I may awake Albion from his long and cold repose. So he is, Blake's writing from first to last is meant to be awake. And my view is that the reason why Blake, who died as obscurity, in complete obscurity, is becoming more and more known, and that here you all are, you know, probably more people than Blake himself ever had listening to him in one room at one time, um, is that we are gradually waking up. But we're not fully awake yet, so we haven't got it yet. Then he goes on to say what it is he's trying to do. And I think it's a wonderful picture of Blake. You've got to think of Blake in this unheated room, you know, candle lit, uh, you know, not being able to afford the fuel for the fire, you know, but burning lots of candles to have sufficient light to do this job that he feels has been put on earth to do. Trembling, I sit, day and night. My friends are astonished at me. <laughs> they were astonished. And lots of them gave up on him, you know, because he was just too strict. My friends are astonished at me, yet they forgive my wanderings. I rest not from my great task. To open the eternal worlds, to open the immortal eyes of man, inward to the worlds of thought, into eternity, ever expanding in the bosom of God, the human imagination. O Saviour, pour upon me thy spirit of meekness and love, annihilate the selfhood in me, be thou all my life. Now, I've heard lots of people saying Blake is anti religion and anti religious, and you know, you can't, what's a Christian? Priest doing talking about William Blake as being some kind of new age mystic. I recognize complete continuity in that statement with all the great Christian mystics. It is absolutely central, everything that he's saying there. Um, and uh, I think Blake is not an isolated one off. I think it's part of the great tradition of mystics and prophets that God raises up in order to wake us up. Um, so just after that, I put his message to the Christians from the book Jerusalem. We'll look at the book Jerusalem in the final session. Um, and he's got uh, a message to the Christians, a message to the Jews, a message to the Muslims, and a message to the atheists in that book. He's got quite interesting. It's all pretty relevant to what's going on in the world now. Um, anyway, um, of course, everybody wants to read the message to the other people and say, oh, you should do something about it. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to concentrate on the message to the Christians, and this is part of it. I know of no other Christianity and of no other gospel from the liberty both of body and mind to exercise the divine art of imagination. Imagination, the real and eternal world, which this vegetable universe is but a plain shadow, and in which we shall live in our eternal or imaginative bodies when these vegetable mortal bodies are with extraordinary stuff. So that's Blake's agenda. And I think to some degree it is also the church's agenda. And I suppose I want to close by saying this. Lots of people, since that day he died in obscurity, mainly in the 20th century, have championed him. Yeats, Kathleen Rain from my own college, who read her great book, Blake and the Tradition, showed that there's a long tradition of mystics, and Blake is part of that. It shows he's not just an isolated genius. But Kathleen Rain is certainly not seeing herself as part of the Orthodox or Orthodox Church. You see yourself as a much wider kind of spirituality, what she calls a perennial philosophy. Northrop Fry, the great literary critic who wrote A Fearful Symmetry and showed Blake's astonishing 
I'm going to be doing a, an on-the-edge service here uh, based on Deleuze's new album, The Tempest. And he does the most amazing thing with Blake's Tiger on that. He takes a couple of the lines of Tiger and, uh, and then inserts a couple of other lines in an amazing song about John Mayer. So Dylan does it. Van Morrison, full of Blake. Lots of people like that. The only people I see not noticing Blake and saying nothing about him are the very people to whom he addressed the message, and that is the Christian church. And it may be that it's tough, maybe we just can't take the criticism. Maybe the fact that he wrote so pertinently, you know, I went to the Garden of Love and I saw what I never had seen, you know, a chapel was built in the midst where I used to play, play on the green, and the gates of that chapel were shut, and thou shalt not rip over the door, and priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars. Maybe that's the kind of criticism from which we haven't recovered yet. Maybe because it's true. <laughs> but I actually think that Blake holds the key to a renewal of spiritual vision, both within the church and beyond. So fairly unapologetically, in the next sessions on, on the innocence and experience, which, in which I will look at the just criticism of the church, and then in the final two sessions on Blake and Jesus and Blake and prophecy, I'm going to try pretty unashamedly to say, what is it that Christianity and the church has to learn from Blake? What ought we to be listening to? And how might some of the things that he said fit with some of the things that we say? I'm not claiming Blake as Mr. Orthodoxy. <laughs> I'm not saying that everything he ever uttered can be squeezed into the Nicene Creed. Uh, far from it. But I am saying... <laughs> That this guy is dealing with the same reality with which we're dealing, and is a gifted visionary. And if he can cleanse the doors of our perception, we ought to let him do it. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Uh, we've got about five minutes for any responses.